Hello. Welcome back to Summer Sea. Let's go. Hmm, maybe we shouldn't. We only have four fuel. How far is Mount Palmerston? We'll go to Mount Palmerston to restock first. Having no fuel is very bad. On the Z. I will be back, Mount Nomad. Just so you wait. Nomad gone. I didn't see him. Oh, there he is. He's on top of uh, the chapel of light. Okay, okay. Well, let's let's try. Oh, you're coming too close. I came too close. Oh my god. Thirty-seven damage. Holy shit. Oh my god. 42 damage. Okay, 35 damage. Okay, I need I need my other other gun to be working. I missed just now. Okay, but we can we can defeat it. Okay, we are damn near dying shit. Oh fuck! Yes! Yes! Oh my god, we are so close to death! 54! Okay, we're not gonna fight anything anymore, okay? <laughs> A shattered cliff. A ship cannot destroy a mountain. All you have won is life and time while it sinks and heals. But for now, Mount Nomad is silent. And here, the wreck of another. Half-consumed ship slides from within. Quickly. Okay, a desperate excursion. Just a few minutes. A great rush of foaming water. The mountain collapses inwards. But you scramble from the wreck of that other ship. Your hands fill with bright treasure. I gain one iron. I've got a Mount Nomad's heart. As well as a captivating treasure. Nice. Was that worth it? Maybe? But now I can't fight anymore because I might die. Okay, I'm going back to Irem to get uh, enough strange catch. For me to make that thing back in my study in London. Every horizon runs deep in Boreas lacquer, but even such primal cold cannot last forever. A worried face, Boreas has something to show you. The nature of snow, Boreas hurries you into the cargo hold. The walls are covered with charcoal marks. See, I'm shorter today. It's only a centimeter shorter than the previous mark. If that, 
But the worry is real. Every day it melts a little more. Oh. The the snow child is starting to thaw. Hmm. On the horizon, a sickly yellow light glimmers for a moment, then fades. Okay, we have to do something about the snow child. That much I know. What's this? Okay, it's not enemy, it's a crab. Okay, we did this before. Let's harvest the meat for supplies, and we lost last time. We succeeded this time. Grab meats. You lead a small complement of your crew out into the gloom. You work swiftly, shattering the claw and twisting the white meat from underneath. Your crew attack the shell with vigor and hammers, while your bosun marks the time in sevens. You return your submarine laden with crab meat. The broken shell is left to the Z. Tree supply is not bad. Okay, let's make our way to Nook, which should be around Nunso, Nuncio here. Let's follow the current. Why is it not faster when I'm following the current? What? <laughs> What's this? Gangway! The monkey foundling barrels down the corridor at full speed, giggling and clutching something in her hand. Boreas follows Cole on her heels, panting desperately between cries of, Give it back to me! Uh, I can walk away and not get involved or lay down the law. No games, not on your ship. A lesson they will not soon forget. You make the pair of them stand outside your cabin, both holding a heavy bucket of water in each hand, while you work through the day's paperwork. S the snickering and half-heard whispering suggests neither is quite getting into the spirit of their punishment. This becomes particularly clear when you push open the slightly ajar door, only to be treated to a sudden ice-cold shower from a carefully placed bucket. Two giggles disappear down opposite corridors, hurrying for hidey holes in which to weather the coming storm. <sighs> I now have one of these tooth of the snow child. Your tooth is falling out, my child. Okay, I think Nook is nearby the bone, isn't it? Why is travelling along the current not as fast as I thought it would be? Yeah, this Nook. Why is this place so terrifying looking? Why? What? The man who stole the sun. This miscreant found his way into the cargo hold and opened a mirror catch box. The box is empty now. He looks down at his feet. Sorry, Captain. It was so shiny. Throw him in the brig! Just desserts. You won't get your sunlight back, but at least you've shown who's in charge. You know I've risked my life to get that sunlight. And you just opened it. I have all the intention to sell it. And I do this because I want a prisoner. For the cladery air. Finally, a chance presents itself. And I will not miss it. Okay, let's go into Nook and see what horror... Again! So many things is happening! Um... Tears, your cheeks are wet. You think for a moment that it's sweat, but then the sorrow hits you like a falling stalactite. You are weeping. You double over. Inconsolable. Um, but I think last time I did the weep, so let's control yourself this time. Stifle your sobs. What is this? Why this sorrow? The ebb tide. You dig your nails into the palms of your hands, pacing the ship. The sorrow retreats like mist to the borders of your thought. You master yourself, but the taste of salt remains. Ah, oh, salt's attention is gone. Okay. Okay, let's go into Nook now. The Age of Nook. A gap in this colossal Z monster's throat has been forced open thick hard metal beams. They strain under the pressure, but hold. As you pass through, your submarine lights 
pass over a message carved in a floating piece of some unfortunate's hull. Beyond is nook, beyond is freedom, beyond is the rest is scratched out. Enter nook, water presses against the airlock door. The breathing and slithering of the beast gives it the rhythm of a drum beat. You mean this city is in the throat of a Z monster that is still alive? What in the actual fuck? Trespasser in freedom. You don your heavy diving suit and give the order to cycle the airlock. Water rushes in and you begin the slow swim down into the port. It soon becomes obvious that you are overdressed for the occasion. The people of Nook swim and breathe in the cloudy, more water with no apparent discomfort. Most are naked, with just a few clad in rotten rags that stream from their skin with no concern for modesty. None will communicate with you if they even can. Those who acknowledge your presence just laugh silently at your bulky suit and unnecessary air holes. You need a different approach. I have to descend naked into Nook, I guess. At least you're unlikely to run into anyone you know. Okay. You undress every button, every stitch. The door opens. Ice cold water rushes upwards. Instinct holds your mouth shut. 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Your lungs burn, holding in that last gulp of air. Your legs trash. You can't hold it in. It escapes. You're choking on water. It forces its way into your lungs. The taste of burning salt suffocating every attempt to gasp, scream, or... Then, through the exhaustion and panic, you realize you're breathing. It's hard work. Your lungs fight against the weight, but it's enough. You can tolerate it, at least for now. The liberal application of wine will make this process easier. In future, bring a cask. Ah, oh, I have to be drunk to get in here? What type of magic is this? How can I breathe underwater, in the sea monster's throat? Okay. Your nook tolerance for nook water quality is now 3. The ruptured throat, a torn pin back cavity in the flesh wall, offers access to the city's monstrous host. Razor sharp teeth the size of buildings jut from fatty garnet red flesh. Many teeth have been quarried out into homes, barricaded by scraps of wood from shipwrecks. Hmm. Let's compile a port report. No one here has anything to hide, actually. No one here is hiding anything at all. Notes on Nook. A vile place, festering, acidic. No laws but those of tooth and claw, written in scars. Civilization? Impossible. Making tea would be a logistical impossibility. Yet the inhabitants seem content. Many have come here from London, the Canate, the Presbyterate, abandoning cultured life for these tenuous existence. They grin, their mouths full of stolen flesh, or float naked and carefree. Many have nothing and nothing to lose. A group of swimmers dart past, hunting gleefully. One squeezes your shoulder, companionably. You've never met her before. Hmm. I've lost one nook tolerance for nook water. Only two. Hmm. It means I could do only two more things before I, need, I can go back. Uh, before I need to go back. Let's... Hmm. Hmm. Let's attempt to mingle with the nook folk. They may be friendlier now that you're fashionably undressed. Lost in freedom. They acknowledge your presence, but little more. Most shrink back, assuming you mean harm. Others deliberately swim just above you in a crude attempt at intimidation. They carry bow knives or tooth-tipped spears. A few gesture to you in welcome? Imitation? It is unclear. The slightly glutinous water makes speech impossible, so the natives have developed a language of signs. You can interpret the most basic, a finger pulled across a throat, for example, is one of the more polite invitations to depart. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
I think I can only do one more thing before we go. Let's swim upwards to the Great Mall. Oh, there's a lot of things if we I swim up or down. Oh. The Great Mall, a twitching cathedral of ivory, flesh and decay. The mall curves far enough to be swallowed by the darkness of the sea. Entire shipwrecks have been mulched between the hooked teeth that dwarf London's mightiest monuments. I can gaze up through the mall. Not many sailors have seen the sea from this angle. Crunching, reading beauty. Light glitters where the false stars shine on the surface of the sea, framed by the mall's dormant teeth. How ancient is this creature? What happened if it swallows? Okay, I've lost all nook tolerance for nook water. This means I have to go back, isn't it? Yeah. Time to leave. Your lungs, unaccustomed to breathing water, begin to labour. You must return to your ship. Old habits. There, the bright light of your submarine's main beam. The airlock. Home. Return from Nook, you swim into the airlock and alert the crew. Air flows in. You wretch the last of the Nook water from your lungs. Return to the crew. Air again. How refreshing. The crew salutes you as you pass. Good. All is well. Anything that happened in Nook shall remain in Nook. Okay. That's all we could do here in Nook. Fascinating. So fascinating. Okay, where shall we go next? Is this something? Is this something over here? Let's go over here and then here to see. This might be a, just a light ship. But what's this? What's that? This way. What? Oh, okay, I don't I don't like that. I don't like neithers. Let's just swim away. What's that? Oh, what's this? Lily pads? Oh, just stuff. Ah, uh, I I know why I can see lily pads because uh, we're underneath the lily pads. Yeah, we're in the sea of lilies. Okay. okay we get this, and then we go up. I think that's where. That's where these other places is, is going here. There must be something. What's this? Scream Shander! We found Scream Shander! Yes! Oh, it looks like this. Entering Scream Shander. Before you looms the bone tower of Scream Shander, the city of remembrance. Ivory structures jut from the pile, supported by buttressing tusk. As your light plays across them, you can make out inscriptions, names, pictures, and dozens of lost languages. The largest one carries a warning, all are welcome to enter, but none may depart without leaving something of themselves behind. I can accept the prize and dock. A drowny floats before the docking gate of a bone cathedral. She wears a cowl and carries a ceremonial key carved from a femur. As you approach, she sings a solemn greeting. Soldier, scholar, servant of art, History welcomes without toll, but be warned, ere you depart, none who enter escape whole. Beware, you will have to pay a price to depart from Screamish Ender. Okay. A cowed crew, the guardian unlocks the ivory gates. Steel glints in her fingers as she carves an image of your ship into her massive bone key. Your brave crew decides to remain on the ship as you disembark for the tower's dry center. A brave crew, huh? Your scream gender history of heroes quality is now one. You walk down a damp nave of bone. Intricately carved ivory walls depict improbable scenes from history. The walls are aged in tiny finger bones, each bearing a single name. Inhabitants wear ashen robes and carry steel tip bone quills, but you recognize most as drownies or chelonite expatriates, 
while most are quiet and ignore visitors, you hear heated arguments over interpretations of the sacred remains. Sacred remains which will include whatever you leave behind when you depart. Oh, I can deliver the cargo of answers. Deliver a monastic drowning. Oh, this is a guy that we picked up a long time ago in Codex, I think. Your silent passenger is transfixed by the murals, eyes wide and mouth agape. His unrepeatable exclamation is the first word you've heard from him. A flood of words. Something within the monastic drowning has been unloosed at the sight of such sweeping histories. After such a long time silent, he is eager to share his own smaller stories, and until he can earn his own bone quill, you are his captive audience. The coins he gives you are valuable, but not as much as the tales that tumble out of him. Ooh. Okay, your scream chandler, a monastic drowning quality is now gone, so he left me. Gave me echoes. You have gained one scream chandler, tides of time. I've gained five Z stories, nice. Okay. And there's this, this too. Deliver a truth hunting challenge. She kneels before an ivory carving of a faceless warrior. Its scarred figure resembles a tattoo on her arm. Hearty appreciation. After saying a wordless prayer, the truth hunting challenge stands and claps you in a fierce embrace. In addition to payment, she proudly presents you with a garland of shark's teeth. My days of hunting monsters is over. Now I hunt heroes through the ages. Ah. Gain 50 echoes. I lost her as well. I gained one hunting trophy. Nice. I didn't realize I have so many things for Scream Shander. I can deliver a cargo of answers. Scream Shander was its original destination. The shipment has been substantially delayed, but thanks to you, it is finally here. An unwanted shipment? A wan archivist scurries forward to look at the cargo as you haul it into the nave. Her eyes shine, but her complexion pales. This is going to cause such an awful fuss. She bends to admire the carvings. The drownings will gloat, and the chelonades will fight to bury it. Best leave it with me before. She is cut off by a sudden clamour. Drowning's voices rising from the depths of the caverns intermingle with the leaden footsteps of Chelonite boots. Oh no, it's starting? Oh no, a cargo in dispute. A moist group of drownies bears down on you. Their leader, a drowny paleographer, looks at the cargo with relish. Excellent, this is worthy of display. How did they hear of this so quickly? Do they have spies at the dock? Her smug smile disappears with the loud arrival of a gang of chelonates, armed with heavy books. They push towards you, their expressions angry. We will bury this insult, one cries. Mm -hmm. This is a hard decision. Ah. We did hide the truth from that uh, scream shander dude in chelonate. Maybe we should side the chelonate. We want our captivating treasure to be worth it, right? That beautiful thing that the Scream Shander dude gave us. And we are more friendly with the Chelonates anyway, in a way, in a weird way. We've delivered a lot of stinky food to them. I shall give the cargo to the Chelonates. It is their history. Indeed it is. Identity preserved. The drownings will. The chelonates are arrogant, boastful. Don't let them bury the truth. But the chelonates have already snatched up the cargo. Downcast, the drownings depart through an arched tunnel. A chelonate chronologist thanks you. The drownings tells us that our history are only stories. Well, they are our stories. He presents you with a collection of dusty relics, then heads after his fellows. Okay, I have five outlandish artifacts. Yep. Okay. Where shall we go next? Let's get a port report. Compile a port report. Consider it an ongoing history of the present. Mm -hmm. Few visitors, fewer departures. 
The inhabitants of Scrimshander spend much of their time preying on the mysteries of the past. They spend almost as much time arguing about their interpretations. Salted residents often collect nearby salvage, studying the results and inscribing their interpretations on any skeletal remains. But those who leave too often are easily recognized by what they have left behind in their travels, memories, personalities, and bones. Otherwise, they rarely consider the present, certainly not with the same focus they give to the histories buried within their tower. Recent world events are met with polite silence, unless it prompts an anecdote about similarities with antiquity. Apart from old grudges and new theories, very little changes here. In a way, it's like a place to study history rather than catching up with recent news. So recent news would be useless here. Okay, let me gather at the stage of history. Scholars file quietly into a pair of great ivory doors at the far end of the hallway. When they stumble out again, you can hear raised voices arguments and laughter. To the amphitheatre, after the reverent silence of the outside, the boisterous noise of the amphitheatre washes over you like the heavy sea beyond these walls. Ah. The stage of history. Actors strut in an amphitheatre of bone, performing historical plays of dubious veracity, and audience watches from below with each roaring drunk member applauding or jeering different details of the work. Above, an imperious figure wearing a crown of ivory judges, each performance from a raised theatre box. All are served by a single man, weaving between the crowd and wearing a perpetual smirk. Hmm. Let's watch a dramatic reenactment. The Drowny Chorus presents a sweeping historical opera with two drink minimum. The echoes, okay. A surprisingly brisk epoch. A city rises and falls in a matter of hours, with cast members playing a dozen roles each over the years. The dance number at the end is a crowd pleaser. Afterwards, the drowning king assures the crowd that the dancing was strictly allegorical. Okay. I've lost terror, nice. I can talk with the Gleep historian. The mushroom wine he serves is stale. The plays he announces are questionable at best, but the impeccably bearded man with the olive skin laughs at every performance and has a smile for every patron. Warring theories on the stage of history. Some cheer history as the work of brave and inspired heroes, especially them who wish they could be heroes themselves. The clip historian rolls his eyes theatrically. Others say it's all shape by cyclical changes of scientific progress, economics and such, but nothing gets in the way of a good story quite like nuances. He spits out the word like a rotten grape. We let them argue up on stage and give an ivory crown to whoever's most convincing at the moment. He waves a hand at the temporary monarch in the raised seat above. But far as I'm concerned, he confides, filling a patron's mug with cheap wine. History is what you make of it, and I make a killing. I've learned enough about history to distrust any one person's interpretation. Ah, okay. Can trade coffee for time in the archives? Can I need to bring dark drop coffee beans? Or trade wine for time in the archives? Oh, either coffee beans or wine. Okay, okay. I can agree to search the ivory archives for a hero. The Chelonate's champions hope to regain their prestige by staging a heroic play. Assist their research in the ivory archives and they'll give you a hero's reward. Oh. No shortage of heroes. They assure you that any hero will do, as long as their deeds are suitably profound, ideally bloody, but the details are negotiable. Oh, I need to trade coffee or wine for time in the archives. Ah, okay, okay. So the coffee and the wine uh, is connected to that. Okay, so I'll leave the amphitheater for now. Let's perform a task for the Chelonade. 
the Chalonade chronologist sits primly atop the cargo of answers. He would appreciate your assistance. A shame that should be forgotten. I've arranged for the cargo to be escorted to the deepest archives. He indicates a muscular monk standing grim-faced next to him. But the escort must remain below to ensure this particular piece of history remains undisturbed. We will accompany him to ensure the deed is done and report back when the aberrant history is safely interred. Okay. You must enter the ivory archives to continue the story. Ah, okay, okay. So I need coffee or wine to progress in either of these uh, quests regardless. Hmm. Yeah, so going to the archives is how I proceed anything here. So for now, we cannot do anything else, so we shall leave. No one departs without leaving something of themselves behind. Be ready. Were there quite this many guards when you came in? Was there always a pile of fresh bones by the entrance? Oh no, departing Scream Shander. No one may depart Scream Shander without leaving something of themselves behind, by which to be remembered. Tradition demands it, as do the muscular guards at the gate. Their sharpened bone quills are at the ready to collect your donation. Oh no. Okay, well, can leave behind a story? That's that's fine, that's fine. Um, I can leave behind a past triumph. Leave behind vitality. Oh no, iron. Warmth for hearts. Leave behind... Leave something a little bit more tangible. One guard carries a butcher's cleaver. With a shudder, recall how many finger bones decorate the tower. Missing finger no more than four. I can... I can leave a finger here? No! No way! There's also this option. Provide transport for a scholar. A bandaged scholar stands near the exit, angrily brushing ash off of himself. At your approach, he brusquely demands passage to hide away. Of course, he'll pay. Do you count? As leaving something behind? In search of history's losers, his studied remains of a hundred wars and read a thousand bitter ends. Now he seeks the survivors so he can interview them in person. He assures you it's a purely academic interest. His life has been splendid, personally. He merely wishes to see how they live with themselves. Ah. Okay, he's ready to go to hide away. I still need to leave something behind. Um, I don't use that much hunting trophies. So let's leave behind a past triumph. It was dearly earned, only fair that it be dearly spent. Some other hero's tale. The guards light incense and clean the trophy with the musky oil, as you recount the victory that won it. A chronicler etches your words into its surface. The scratching of the bone quill grows louder in your ears with every word. By the time you finish, your trophy has been replaced with an identical copy. But this one has been inscribed with a trailing fictional tale. As you depart, you wonder if you would recognize the hero of such a trailing yarn. Okay, mm -hmm. that's all we could do here. Okay, as long as we have hunting trophies, I think we should be fine for Scream Chandler. We don't need to leave behind our finger. Okay, uh, I think this might be a light ship, but let's go and investigate. This way... Anti! It's a new place! <gasps> so many new places! Oh, this looks pretty. Anti. They call it the City of Flowers, but the flowers are crystals. Spiral matrices grown on the walls of Antian caves. The inhabitants of Anti are at least partly crystal too. They call it going sharp, becoming more perfect and clearer and colder. Ah. Study the chambers of Anti. Wonder where you can. Gain a preliminary understanding of the place. Okay. Why 
is there a Mount Palmerston's music here? I guess we are close enough to Mount Palmerston. Those who go sharp. The inhabitants of Anti go sharp. Not all at once, but piece by piece. They turn to crystal. They sort themselves by sharpness too. The sharp-handed cluster with others of their kind, ignoring the keen-footed and the brittle wasted. To progress through Anti is to take on more and more of these attributes, to enter the deeper chambers restricted by sharp style. Choose which chambers you would like most to discover. The Antians speak of a woman named Rosina, dying of a curious disease and sequestered among the sharp spleen. Okay, you've seen the outer chambers of Anti and learn what the place is. Mm, let's gather a port report on Anti. The Emirati will want stories of this place. Rumors and extrapolations. Access to Anti is restricted by type of sharpness. Those who are sharp in the ears do not necessarily mingle with the sharp tongue. As for the as for the inhabitants who are sharp throughout their full bodies, they don't circulate much. There is said to be a cavern, broad and shallow floored where the perfectly sharp grow old together. They aren't capable of anyone else's company anymore, at least. That's what you're told, and you can hardly go and ask. At any rate, they are more like growing crystals than like people, slowly expanding and bonding with the rock. Okay? Let's consider my own condition. Should you go sharp? Or have you already taken on sharpness that you now regret? Learning and rumor. Consult the women with the cubical eyes. Learn how to accept the blessings that Anti offers. Determine what is best for yourself and whose companionship you seek in the bubble caverns. Ah, the pursuit of sharpness. A woman gives advice to new Antians. Her eyes are cubes of salt. She speaks of going sharp as a numbness and as an awakening as the loss of sensation and the beginning of insight. Some Antians use other metaphors, clarity, dryness, regularity, and structure. I can... Cultivate the capacity for sharpness. It isn't easy to go sharp as the Antians do, but most who come here find themselves desiring the condition sooner or later. Nights of Meditation. The environment is a help but you must also prepare your mind and your will. Going sharp means giving up many sensations. You can now take on a single sharpness. Oh. Interesting. I can go sharp in many areas. I can go sharp in the spleen, in the liver, let your lungs become a chamber of crystal. Flourish in the groin. Undergo accumulation of the tongue. Mineralize your skeleton. Let your skin be clear as water and hard as armor. I, I can cut away all your sharpness. Hmm. But I can only do two for now. Spleen and liver. Let's try with the spleen. Surrender your capacity for anger. Join the society of diplomats, saints, and cold-blooded tyrants. The Venus Saloon. The sand into the antechamber reserved for those who flourish at the spleen. The stone of the chamber is vined with red. Some members of the Venus Salon wear clothes that reveal the midriff so that one can see the telltale points of the crystal form under their skin. It is a party game here to take turns reading aloud offensive letters to the London newspapers and insulting missives from home, and to compete at not caring in the least. My spleen is a hexagonal crystal. Okay. Hmm. I can now visit Rosina in her chambers. She is both healer and patient. Convalescing in an ice bath among the sharp spleen, the Antians speak to her often. Ice crystals. The air gets chillier as you approach. There are patches of frost on the walls. 
Oh, hello, Rosina. The cavern is crowded. In the center is a bathtub full of ice, in which sits a woman in an obvious state of illness. Several antients attend her, one with deaf, clear fingers. Then there are a number of other people attending, who mostly talk among themselves, but sometimes return to watch Rosina. Hmm... Let's meet Rosina. It is rude to not... It is rude to come in and not meet her anyway. She has seen you come in. Baked from within, Rosina is dying of animescence, the disease of the elder continent. Any passion speeds the disease. She must, therefore, lie very still in an ice bath and think of things that do not interest her. Going sharp in the spleen protects her against the passion of anger, but other passions are still a danger. For a long time, she looked for a cure to the disease. Tradition ascribes healing features to certain poems, ointments, and postures of the body, but these only delay the gradual combustion. Oh, you're like my brisk campaigner. Hmm. Let's learn more of Rosina. Speak to her of her choices and what she requires. She tells you her story. For a long time, she looked for cures of the body. I was certain the inhabitants of the elder continent would be able to correct what is wrong, she says. But if, they, but if they know how, they refuse to say. Now, I merely keep back the disease as long as I can, and seek cures of the sentiment instead. If I keep very calm, my symptoms subside. If you find anything in your travels, works of philosophy or guidance that may that might help me compose myself, please bring them to me, okay? Oh wow, I can do a lot of things here. Although a lot of them I cannot do right now. Okay. I can present a drowny counterpoint to Rosina. The light and gloom might counterpart each other. Would this hasten Rosina's animescence or slow it? Hmm. Okay, this is for the drowny thing. Should I use it here though? I don't think I can get this thing again because I, I think I lost the drowny, isn't it? Oh, I cannot go to my hold. Hmm. Let's try some other options. The needle of Fortas is not so bad. I can definitely do that because I can get more needles of Fortas. Hmm. Let's do this instead. Find out what all the onlookers are for. They aren't assisting in any medical proceedings, right? Carrion birds! You put your question. Rosina glances over at the cluster of men and women. Her expression is blank. The emotion that ought to be there has been controlled or wiped away. There are certain idiotic sex, she says. People who want to suffer what I have. They follow me around, hoping to be infected by my conflagration. Ah, they want the animations. Why? Okay, let's... Maybe you should offer her the needle for task. If you tell her it is a sort of medicine, she might permit it. In the upper arm, beneath the skin, Rosina makes no sound as you puncture her arm. In a moment, she knows that you have tricked her. There is some horrible recollection in the needle, and she weeps as she remembers it. Her cheeks are flushed with the effects of animations, and the tears evaporate away again almost at once. Oh no. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rosina. I did not expect that. I was expecting the other type of uh, emotions like regret, desperation. Those go cold, right? I guess I was just not thinking clearly. Okay, what else? What else do you need uh, that I can offer? Drowny love song for Rosina. This requires the, the, the thing from the hood. Drowny hymn, also from the hood. A story from Low Barnet. Okay, I need to be a storyteller in Low Barnet. Provide a dry lecture on the social stratification of this age. I need something that awaits you. Ah. Oh. I don't have something that awaits you up oh, because we left Scream Shander just moments before. I see. 
I could easily do this. I don't think romantic literature would help because this makes us like uh, hot and bothered, right? What about approved romantic literature? Hmm. Antian romance. Ah, how do I get this? Okay, well, let's let's go back to NT. Let's go back to NT first. Return to the rest of NT. Leave the sick chambers. The staircase. The way is steep. Up cut stone stairs. Sometimes it becomes ladder rather than a staircase at all. After the first few flights, you can no longer hear the murmur of conversation in the sick room. Okay. I'll consider my own condition. Okay. What else can we do here? What do I need for this? Cultivate the capacity for sharpness through chemical means. I need unread log and two milk salt. Hmm. What else to unlock the other ones? Sharp in the liver. Okay, I don't know how to unlock all these other ones. I could try the unread log and mutasol one. But I don't know how to unlock all these others. Maybe I just need to come back later on. So let's relinquish the pursuit for now. Perhaps there is other business for you in NT. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we have no business in for, with Rosina as well. So let's just leave. Okay. <laughs>